Happy Sabbath and welcome, Scott Zell Thunderbird Church family, to our online service. Uh, We're glad that you're joining us remotely. I do have some exciting news. Uh, we will be uh, uh, introducing our new pastor on July the 25th. We also plan to have the church open to the public on that date. We will be observing social distancing. Uh, we will want that you also bring a face mask and that, um, you know, we kind of um, be careful with our fellowship. I know it's very hard for us. We're really social beings, but we want to be mindful uh, uh, about each other and taking care uh, of one another as we work to safely reopen the sanctuary and have everybody uh, be present uh, for our pastor. I know we've been waiting a long time. We also want to encourage you to keep him in his prayers. Uh, he's in the process of moving. He's trying to get his uh, home sold uh, in Washington, and then he'll be here uh, house hunting uh, a week prior to his installment. Uh, so uh, let's open up, bow our heads, and open up with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for another day. Thank you that we have your Holy Sabbath and that you care for us and love us, that you dedicated a day specifically uh, to exalt your name, to get close to you. Uh, please help us find rest not just physically, emotionally, but also spiritually uh, in you and your ho uh, holy, holy day. We thank you for all the blessings that you give us, and we ask that your Holy Spirit can comfort those who might be suffering during this time. In your name we pray, amen. So, church family, I just also want to remind you that we have a Wednesday a prayer meeting at 7 p.m., and we have a young adult Sabbath school at 10 a.m. Those are through uh, Zoom uh, meetings. And if you want to reach out uh, through us to our Instagram, Facebook, or email uh, us uh, as well, and we'll get you uh, connected to the email blast that goes from the church. Uh, welcome. Enjoy. Good morning. The scripture reading today is found in Revelation 7, verses 1, 2, and 3. And it reads, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Good morning. Man, that's some exciting news that we're going to be open to welcome our new pastor. I'd uh, like to reiterate the social distancing, um, you know, in Jesus' time, there was an infectious disease and they had social distancing. It was called leprosy. And the only person when Jesus was walking the earth that ignored those guidelines was Jesus. And that's because no disease can stand in his presence. If no disease can stand in your presence, then by all means, but the rest, you know, I think all of us should be careful and maintain whatever we need to, masks, distance. So please keep that in mind when we come back together. Uh, since we're dealing with Revelation today, it uh, seems like even more important, let's bow our heads for prayer one more time, if you don't mind. Good morning, Father. Thank you so much for another Sabbath. Man, I love the rest that it provides, I love the closeness that it gives us, that we know that you've asked us once a, once a week to set some time aside and just spend with you and working on this relationship with you. Thanks for taking that time and setting it aside. So we're opening your word. Please show us what you want us to see and open our hearts and minds to you. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. A Revelation, awesome, awesome book. Revelation 7, the verses that Lisa just read about the seal, 
I had one of, one of my favorite professors said, a text without a context is a pretext. So whatever passage you want to understand, it's always good to look at the context of that passage. So let's actually back up a few verses into chapter 6 and see what's going on before these, this angel comes out asking to put a seal on. Let's go back to chapter 6, verse... Um, Verse 12, and it says, I looked when he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, made with hair, and the whole moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree with unripened figs as shaken by a great wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll, and it rolled up. Every mountain and every island were moved out of their places. Then the kings of the earth, the great men, and the commanders of the rich and the strong, and every slave and freed men hid themselves in caves among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come. And who is able to stand? It, we all know what this is talking about. This is the second coming of Jesus. This is the great apocalypse of Jesus coming to earth. The dead in Christ are raised up and go back with him, but everybody that's left has this great time of panic as they realize they're lost and they're destroyed. It ends with this question, and who will be able to stand? In my Bible, there's uh, chapter heads or section heads. And before chapter 7, it says an interlude. This is kind of a pause. Chapter 7 is an interlude. Uh, think of it like if you studied Shakespeare, you remember that they would have their dialogues on stage and then Every once in a while, everybody would freeze on stage, and one of the actors would turn to the audience and start talking. It was called an aside. And he would tell what his thoughts were, what his plans were, something like that. It's a pause, an interruption, to kind of explain what's going on. That's what chapter 7 is. So at this time, where this great calamity happens... To answer that question, who will be able to stand, it says in chapter 7, verse 1, And I saw four angels standing in the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds. Now, the first thing that we can say is, God is in control. And when we see 2020, everything that is happening around us, all the things that seem to be happening one after another, we don't have to be afraid because we know from this verse God is in control. We know that the end is not going to come until God says, okay, that's it. I'm ready. Everybody's ready. Let's go. That should relieve a lot of fear. The next thing is, it says, verse 2, I saw another angel ascending from the rising sun, having the seal of the living God, and he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels. Verse 3, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bondservants of God in their foreheads. Now the question is, what is a seal? There's basically three types of seals. There's a seal like a stamp. It's a certification from the owner of that stamp that says, I certify under my name that this is good. This is up to my standards. The next one is to seal something from another section. This would be like the seal on your refrigerator door. That seal takes the area in your refrigerator and seals it off from the rest of the space so it can keep that area cool. Your refrigerator is sealed. The last one is a state of permanence. Something that cannot be revoked. 
An example of this would be, he has sealed his fate. The seal that is talked about here is the same seal if you hold your hand right here and flip over to John chapter 3, verse 33. John 3, verse 33. This is John the Baptist's last sermon, and he's talking about Jesus. And he says of Jesus, who, He who has received his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. And the seal in Greek is a word that means permanence. This is something that cannot be revoked. Whoever has the seal of God has been set that God is true, and that belief is not going to be reversed. The next thing it says, the seal is placed on the forehead. Why the forehead? What is behind our forehead? Well, our, our brain, obviously, right? But what part of our brain? Directly behind the forehead is the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is the part of the brain where we make our moral decisions, where we decide what is right or wrong, and we follow depending on what we believe is right or wrong. I give an example of frontal lobes for different animals. A cat, for the frontal lobe of a cat, it's only about three and a half percent of their brain. You ever notice a cat when it kills a mouse? It takes that mouse and it just, it doesn't kill it. It just kind of plays with it and, oh, I'll let you go. Oh, no, I lied. Oh, let, no, I'm not going to let you go. And it just plays with it until finally, when it gets bored, it puts it out of its misery and eats it. A dog. A dog has 10% of their brain that is frontal lobe. If a dog kills something, it does it quickly and decisively. It doesn't hesitate. It wants to get it over with as quick as possible. Three and a half percent to ten percent. The human, about a third of the brain is the frontal lobe. We have much more capacity for empathy, for moral thought, for moral decisions. Since Revelation 6 talks about the destruction of the earth, and Revelation talks about how the only people that will survive that destruction are the ones with God's seal, the ones permanently affixed in their frontal lobe that God is true. It makes sense to understand what this seal is, how, it, how we get it, and what it does for us. Now let's look at the first example of a person wearing a seal on their forehead. Let's go all the way back to Exodus chapter 28. Exodus chapter 28. And this is where it's talking about, helps if I'm in Exodus, not Genesis. Exodus 28, it didn't look right there for a minute. Exodus 28, this is where it's talking about the garments that were made for the priests. And it says, uh, skip down to verse 36. It says, you will also make a plate of gold and shall engrave on it like the engravings of a seal. Holy to the Lord. You shall fasten it on a blue cord and it shall be on the turban. It shall be on the front of the turban. It shall be on Aaron's forehead. Aaron had on his forehead a seal that read, Holy to the Lord. Was Aaron a sinner? How would this imperfect being get to have a seal on his forehead that says, 
holy to the Lord. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew, uh, be ye holy even as your Father in heaven is holy. How can we as imperfect beings be holy? Well, it kind of makes sense to look at how Moses got to be the high priest. What, what was the consecration service that placed him in this position to where he could walk in the throne room of God and not be killed. God said, you can't see my face or it'll kill you. But yet the high priest once a year would walk into the most holy place. In the most holy place was the Ark of the Covenant. On the Ark of the Covenant was the mercy seat. On that mercy seat was God. The Ark of the Covenant was God's throne on earth. How could a man who was sinful walk in front of the presence of God? Let's look at Leviticus chapter 9. I'm sorry, chapter 8. And look at the consecration service for Aaron. If we look at chapter 8, verse 14, it says, Then he, that's Moses, brought the bull of the sin offering, and Aaron and his sons laid their hand on the head of the bull. Before Jesus, there was a sacrifice. All the way back to the Garden of Eden, when somebody sinned, they would place their head on the animal and say, I am a sinner. I deserve to die because of my sins. I am taking faith the animal was not enough to take away the sin, but in faith, they believed that that animal represented a Savior that would come. That is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So the first thing that Aaron had to do in serving as the high priest is to admit in front of the entire congregation, I'm a sinner. I'll tell you, I am a sinner. In fact, 1 John chapter 1 says, if you say you're not a sinner, you are a liar, and the truth is not in you. But although I'm a sinner, Romans 5 verse 1 says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus has died for my sins, I have faith in that death, that sacrifice for me, that Jesus' sacrifice has paid for my sins. Therefore, when Jesus, when, when the God the Father looks at me, he looks at me as if I have lived the life of Jesus. Praise God. So the first thing that Aaron had to do was trust in that sacrifice. The next thing, in verse 18, I'm sorry, verse 23, uh, verse 22, he presented a second ram that also represented each, uh, uh, Jesus. Aaron and his sons laid their hand on the head of that ram. Verse 23, Moses slaughtered it and took some of its blood and put it on the lobe of Aaron's right ear, on the thumb of his right hand, and on the toe of his right foot. What is this all about? Most of us are right-handed. Now, Forgive the symbolism if you're left-handed. The symbolism still works. I mean, it would just be on your left ear, your left thumb, and your left toe. The idea is, if you are right-handed, you are predominantly right side. So if you're going to listen to something, if you're going to pay attention to something, if you're going to think about something, you might lean in with your right ear. If you're about to do something, you might reach out with your right hand. If you're going to go do something, you might step off with your right foot. So with everything after that justification process where Aaron laid his hand on the head of the bull representing Jesus, and he says, I am taking faith in the sacrifice to come. After that, everything that Aaron does is covered by the blood of Jesus, everything that he pays attention to. But Aaron has to think about that too. When I think about something, think about the sacrifice that Jesus has paid for. When I go to do something, think about what Jesus has done for me. When I go 
to some place to do something. Before I step off, think about Jesus. It involves a thought process of our entire life to put it in perspective of what Jesus has done for us. The last thing for the consecration that I talk about is verse 33 in chapter 8. It says, You shall not go outside of the doorway of the tent of meeting for seven days until the day that the period of your ordination is fulfilled. You see, in order for Aaron to be sanctified, he had to spend time with God. In order for any of us to be sanctified, in order for any of us to have our frontal lobe purified, we need time with God. I've been thinking a lot about the parable of the ten virgins. All ten of them were asleep. That represents the church. Right now, the church is sleeping. While the church is sleeping, we have a choice of what we're going to do with that time. Five were foolish, and they spent their time just doing whatever they wanted. Five of them were wise, and they made sure that they had enough oil to take them through what happened when the church woke up. I want to look at another example of someone sealed in their forehead. Let's look at Ezekiel chapter 3. Because the question is, what is the seal? We've answered that, right? But what does it do for us? And what does that mean as far as our witnessing to the world? Ezekiel chapter 3, it says, verse 6, Verse 5, for you are not being sent to a people of unintelligible speech or difficult language, but to the house of Israel, nor to many peoples of unintelligible speech or difficult language, whose words you cannot understand. But I have sent you to them that, who should listen to you. Yet the house of Israel, verse 7, the house of Israel will not be willing to listen to you, since they're not willing to listen to me. Surely the whole house of Israel is stubborn and obstinate. Behold... I love this. Verse 8, Behold, I have made your face as hard as their faces, and your forehead as hard as their foreheads. Like emery harder than flint, I have made your forehead. Do not be afraid of them or dismayed by them, for they are a rebellious house. The destruction of Jerusalem is a type of the destruction. It's an example of what's to come of the destruction of the entire world. And Ezekiel's told, I'm sending you to some people that are stubborn. They're not going to listen to you. They're not going to want to hear what you have to say. And they are going to do everything that they can to block your message. They said, but don't worry. I have sealed your forehead. I have made your forehead harder than theirs. When we see people attacking us for being Christians... Jesus said, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. It's not fun. But he has set a seal in our foreheads that says, God is true, and I will not go against that. What did the destruction look like? It gives us an example of what's to come. Let's go over to Ezekiel chapter 9. In verse 1, he says, Then he cried out in my hearing with a loud voice, saying, Draw near to me, O executioners of the city, each with his destroying weapon in his hand. Verse 2, Behold, six men came from the direction of the upper gate. You know, they all come. He says, There was one with a writing case at his loins. In verse 3, The glory of of the God of Israel went up from the cherub on which it had been to the threshold of the temple, and he called to the man clothed in linen whose loins was the writing case. And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, even through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark 
on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over the abominations which are being committed in the midst. And then he told the rest of them, go destroy. And, and Ezekiel's looking at all this destruction that's happening around him, and he says, God, there's no one left. That's a question that Jesus asked at one point. He said, when the Son of Man comes, will there be any righteousness on the earth? The, the answer to the question has to do with what we're doing as the church is asleep. Are we filling our oil, or are we ignoring God? or doing our own things. It's not bad to do our own things, but how much of our time is spent with prayer, Bible study? Are we getting to know God in the extra time that we have? When we look around, are we sad at the things that are happening? I think a lot of people are. I've seen a lot of things this year that I never thought would happen. I'm not saying that Jesus is coming in the next week, the next month, the next year. But I'm saying that I see things happening that have never happened before in my lifetime. And it makes me think it's even more important to study, to pray, to get close to God. What does it say that things are going to be like before Jesus comes. Let's go over to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter 3. In verse 1 it says, But realize this, in the last days difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. I don't want to stop there. It says... Avoid such men as these. And this is something that I have a hard time with. See, I love Facebook. And people, I have fallen to this too, like to put all of their opinions on Facebook. And guess what? None of our opinions match. So then we get into arguments, but I can't believe that you believe that. How wrong can you be? As we see more and more things, where I think that I can definitely see this description a lot. And I'm not saying everybody in this nation or this world fits this description, but I can see this description growing and growing in our society. And it's so easy for me to say, I can't believe how wrong this is. Let me stand up against it and, and let's, let's philosophize about it and let's, let's get into all these political arguments about it. The text says, avoid such, things, uh, such men's as these. Do not get into these political arguments. Well, if we're not supposed to get into political arguments... We're not supposed to go and, and butt heads with these people that are acting so strange. What do we do? Well, the first thing we do, skip down to verse 14. It says, you, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads unto salvation through the faith which is in Jesus Christ. All scriptures is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequately equipped for every good work. So the first thing we need to do is pray and study so that we can be wise enough to see through the deception that's happening. 
The next thing, if we are going to confront a problem, don't confront it with, well, this is history or this is ludicrous because of this. You confront it with, this is what the Bible says. Because our opinions can be argued back, well, that's just your opinion. But the Bible is a foundation that can never be changed. It is a two-edged sword. This two-edged sword, this is the problem. If we don't spend time with God and allow him to change our hearts, we will misuse this Bible. We will misuse this two-edged sword. What will happen is, because we only have head knowledge of the Bible, we will swing this sword at the head when this is meant to pierce the heart. We need that time with God to change our hearts so that we can share this with others so it can change their hearts. So verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 1 tells us what to do. It says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing and by his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, extort, but with great patience and, and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. And we'll turn away from the truth and we'll turn aside to myths. But you, be sober in all things. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. We need hard-headed Christians. We need people that will spend time with the word. Spend time in prayer. Spend time filling that oil. Spend time allowing God to rework our foreheads to put that seal that we cannot be reversed. And then we can take that Bible, we can take the scripture, we can take Jesus to others and say, here's the answer to everything that's happening. I wanted to share one last thing in closing because it was the 4th of July last week. And I love, I, 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 I love this nation but this nation is not going to endure past the second coming. This nation was founded before the Constitution. We had a Declaration of Independence. It said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed with their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it goes on to say that because of this, governments have to be established, and you shouldn't uh, overthrow those governments for light reasons. You, you should suffer, if necessary, not to overthrow those governments up to a point. But it says, but when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing in, invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under a absolute depotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provoke and to provide new guards for their future security. What I'm suggesting is The king of this world has been a tyrant. And we have put up with his abuses for a long time. We have suffered for a long time. And it is time for us to declare our hearts and our minds that we are free from his tyranny. That we are setting up a new government Actually, that government has already been set up for us. All we have to do is declare ourselves free from the tyranny and citizens of the new government. I'm not saying that we become anti-American or anything else, but that is not where our true citizenship lies. Our true citizenship is heaven. 
It goes far beyond this nation. And it is time for us to declare freedom for our hearts and our minds to say this is God's kingdom. Let him set his flag here. Let him purify my mind and set his seal of permanence on me. Please set your seal on us. Prepare us for your kingdom. Come into our hearts and just draw us closer and closer to you, I pray in Jesus' name.